what's our North Star? If I'm saying that we are here to win a national championship as a coach, or we are here to be elite in everything that we do, or we are here to serve the underserved, whatever it might be, that are, then the people who are coming there will be aligned with that. And if they're not, what happens is, as soon as something hard comes or tough, they look to jump ship. And we haven't taken care of alignment of purpose. When there's alignment of purpose, what happens on a high-performing team? Innovation goes up, grievances go down, profits go up, sick days go down, retention and well-being go up. All the negative things go away. I want people to set expectations that may not be reachable. I don't think there's any failure in that um, because the goal is not to reach the expectations and celebrate. It's I want you to think about whatever the goal is, there's a whole bunch of steps that lead towards that. It's like you're going up a pyramid and here's the step one and here's step two and here's step three and here's step four because we need to celebrate the processes along the way. We don't do that. We save all our magic for when we achieve the goal. Yay! We have to recognize that some goals, some things that we're going to have are going to be five-year, 10-year, 15-year, 20-year goals, lifetime goals. And there's nothing wrong with that. Welcome to the Performance Initiative Podcast. Our goal is to provide you and ourselves with the tools to be the best versions of ourselves. We are your hosts, Dr. Grant Cooper and Dr. Zanovi Mailer. We just wrapped up a very interesting conversation with Dr. Ivan Joseph on the topic of self-confidence. And among many other things, we discussed how to develop self-confidence confidence as a skill. That's right. We asked him, what's the best way to obtain and to retain new skills, whether it's on the athletic field or in the boardroom? And we also discussed how to differentiate self-confidence from hubris or ego. And also, what are some concrete ways that people can improve their self-talk so that we're not all constantly beating ourselves up in our own minds all the time. There's no one better to talk to you about these things than Dr. Ivan Joseph. Ivan, uh, he, he was a, a soccer coach who took a small team and turned them into national champions. His TED Talk, titled The Skill of Self-Confidence, has had over 29 million views. Uh, it, it made it onto the Forbes list of the 10 best TED Talks for graduates about the meaning of life. His book titled, You Got This, Mastering the Skill of Self-Confidence, is a bestseller. And just overall, he's had an amazing career. He is a joy to talk to, a wealth of positivity. We are confident <laughs> that you are really going to enjoy this one. Ivan, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. You make the case in your books and in your talks that self-confidence is the key to success and that confidence is a trait that can be trained strengthened and sharpened like any other skill. That's right. And we wanted to start by filling out what exactly confidence is and how we should think about it. And for starters, is having good self-confidence the same thing as having high self-esteem? What are the similarities, similarities between those and what are some of the differences? Well, folks, first off, thanks for having me on this show. Uh, you know, this is a great topic and one that's near and dear to my heart. So let's start with the first thing. What is self-confidence? For me, it's this genuine belief in your ability to accomplish the task at hand. And there's two key words I want you to think about there is this genuine belief, not this fake it till you make it belief, right? Um, and genuine belief comes because you've honed your skill, you've practiced, you've, you've, you've put in the work. And so you can, you have this genuine belief and it's usually related to a task at hand, whatever is coming up. People say, well, what's the difference between self-confidence and ego I get? Not usually self-esteem, right? So self-confidence happens to do with what you tell yourself. What's that internal dialogue that's going on in your head, right? Whereas ego is what you're telling others, you know, the brag sheet about what everybody, listen to me, look how good I am. Walk around with your medals and say, look at me. Self-esteem and self-confidence are very interrelated. No different than the word might be grit or resilience, or hardiness, uh, mental toughness. You know, over time, the literature changes, but it's still the same genuine core principle, which is, do you believe in your ability to tackle and do hard things and mm -hmm. be successful? Now, so it's something that, that we were trying to reconcile, and I, I think I have a way to reconcile it, but, but let, me, let me put it to you first. Um, we talked to uh, Roy Baumeister, who's a, a, a famous psychologist, and he does a lot of work on self-esteem. And one of the things that they find is that um, 
having high self-esteem doesn't always correlate with with having um, high success with things. So for example, American mm-hmm. students have the highest self-esteem in terms of how well they're going to do on a math exam, even as they score the lowest compared to other countries. In, in, and, the, world, yeah. with, in, in, in the world, yeah. In the world. And, and, and they leave the exam. It's not before the, it's before the exam and after. So even yeah. after taking the exam that they just did the worst on, they come out and say, we did the best. Now, but what I like about the idea of the self-confidence is that it's, it seems more tied to this iterative practice that, that you cone your skill. But how can we parse those two? Or, or is it just, you know, have you really earned that self-confidence? Well, it's a good question. And, I'm, and, you know, you're making me think a little bit here. Because here's the deal. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the American students coming out of that math test and feeling good about themselves and feeling like they had the best ever results, regardless of the outcome of if they weren't. Because what I'm more worried about was if they felt like they were terrible and they were really, really badly and they never try again. Mm -hmm. What I'm really concerned with, I want them to be surprised. I want them to say, I must've had a bad day. This is why I didn't score so well. Then they're able to persist, put in more work and do better and take that test again. Yeah. You, right? you, you want them to be angry about it almost. And yes. say, oh, I'm going to double that. So I, I guess the trick is, how do you make sure that when you're, when you're angry, sort of insulted that you didn't do as well as you thought, that the self-confidence kick, clicks in to say, okay, we're going to work twice as hard so that next time there's no way that that can happen, as opposed to, well, that should never have happened. I'll just walk right back into that test and I'll kick its butt. <laughs> or, or, or rather, yeah. blaming the test for not being fair. Right, or, right, right, right. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. And here's the thing, right? This is the delusion that m- needs to come with it. Right. And I, I think there's a healthy dose of self-confidence paired with persistence. You'll hear me talk about my, t- in my Ted talk that, you know, it's not just repetition, repetition, repetition. It has to be paired with persistence. Yeah. But I do think that with confident people, they blame, maybe it's not the, the test in this case, but you know, the athlete who doesn't get picked, they blame the coach for not recognizing their talent or the person who lost their way and didn't get their job. Well, that selection committee didn't know what they were thinking about. I do think there's some value in being able to explain away your failures to external factors, but also recognize that there's an internal locus of control that you must do in order to accomplish the task at hand. And this is where it gets really nuanced. Yeah. I don't want somebody to just say, I believe, I slept at the Holiday Inn last night so I can do whatever it is. Right. right. That's the delusional part that needs to come away from this. I told you that doesn't work for medicine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and is there, is there a way to sort of, um, is there a check that you can do on yourself to make sure that you are, that you maintain that fine balance of confidence? Yeah. As, oppo- as opposed to that bravado. Well, this is what I tell people when they ask me. It's like, how do you, what's the, what do you, how do you exercise the difference between delusion and confidence? What's confidence is you've accomplished it already in the practice arena, right? You've taken the, let's say it's medical school tests. You've taken the MCATs tests and you scored 12s or 13s. Yes, now you're in an en- environment that might be a little bit different, but you know what? You've done it before. You know, you've shot a thousand free throws from this spot. You scored 90%. You know that you're going to, you're going to be okay here. Right. right. And so what I want people to recognize, though, is that difference between maladaptive perfectionism that sometimes folks have, high performers have, where they expect to be perfect, 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 and they only score eight out of 10 and then they quit. That's the piece that I'm dealing with also with confidence. Mm, yeah. Would it be fair? And I'm, I think I'm jumping the gun a little bit because I, I thought we would get to that question a little bit later. But um, would it be fair to say there are some people that are confident when they are coming into a new situation? into a task that they have never done before, right? And they seem to have that confidence. Would it be fair to say that people that are exposed to new situations and tend to persevere know that they have done this before? This being attempted a task that is new to them and they are new to this task, whatever that may be, a new sport, a new, you know, new study. And by, by exposing ourselves to these new tasks, we gain the confidence to undertake a new, a new challenge. Is that yeah. fair to say? I think it's fair to say that people's past history dictates how they interpret their past history's success or failure dictates how they will approach and interpret new similar situations. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the key piece here is 
the volleyball player who's successful on the court, who's always been a successful athlete, is not going to go into the medical school, you know, lab and be successful on day one, right? right? And so this is the thing is like self-confidence isn't global from task to task, especially when they're really unique and different from each other. Yeah, but, but maybe the confidence is, I've, I, I know that I've had challenges before, I know I've overcome them. So when I see a new challenge, I have, I've, I've developed this, you know, the, the skill set of overcoming challenges, I'll apply that same skill set to this yes. nature. And, and, and also thing. the idea of perseverance, because yes. it does take that yeah, perseverance. That's part of that skill set, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. knowing that you're gonna have to iterate or yes. you know, you dig deep to, to do it. And, and I there, think there's, it's really important for your listeners to hear because that piece about perseverance or persistence or being able to stick to the task until they accomplish a certain level of success is really key because when they try something new, it always dips. And that's when you've got to use your self-talk and all your coping skills to weather that dip to get to the other side of excellence. Yeah, and the, the, there, there is this curse of knowledge, right? So that we forget what it was like not to know. Yeah. When, we, when we've been in a field for a while. I can't remember it all. <laughs> <laughs> there is that curse of knowledge. And so, so it may behoove us to just keep trying new things so that we remember what it's like to be an, a newbie at something, to be awkward at something, and still persevere. It will make us better mentors, leaders, and teachers, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, I, I keep thinking as, as you're talking and we're talking about this theme of confidence, there's, we, we talked to a number of Navy SEALs who all say that you know, during, during BUDS and that, that whole arduous uh, selection process, the ones that sometimes have the hardest problems are the ones that were the best athletes that, that had never that had never failed that were you know and then they come in supremely confident because because they because they you know they're, they're so used to kicking ass and then they get put in situations where you know inevitably you, you are going to not be able to physically overcome it and they're not used to that um, so I, I guess the question is how do you on the one hand you want people to have confidence you want them to learn to, to succeed and on the other hand, you have to have them, you, you have to, you know, sort of give them chances to fail too and make sure they do fail so that when they inevitably hit a block, you know, get to the next level in sport where they're not the biggest and the baddest, that they don't quit and that they, that they've learned, that they know they can overcome. How do you manage that balance? This is such a crucial point because here's the deal, right? We don't want to be uncomfortable. And so soon as we are uncomfortable, we usually pick up our ball and go home. Um, I see it as me as even the psychologist with my kid as a parent. I wanted my kid to have immediate success. And so when he wasn't the starter on the soccer team, I'm, the soccer, I'm gonna put him in swimming. And when he wasn't great in swimming, I'm gonna find him in karate and then not karate football. I got 16 different helmets and sporting. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, is we as parents or as leaders or as educators, have to allow our kids, our people, our teams to fail. This is, Carol Dweck talks about this the best in the growth mindset, when she talks about praising the process, not the outcome. Yeah. We, we want and celebrate anytime they get first, first, first. So then they think that they're only worthy and valued and really adding contribution to society if they're number one. Instead, what I've learned and, and what was really helpful for me is it's about the effort that you've put in. If my kid puts in the night before and turns in a paper and gets an A plus, I'm not praising the heck out of that. Mm. But if they work for two weeks and got a B or a B minus or a C, there's where the praise comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we have forgotten this part. And so to your listeners out there, we must let them fail. But with scaffolding and supports that ask two questions that confident people ask, what am I here to learn? And who am I here to teach? And in that design thinking of, of, of what am I here to learn, we can't stop at the first answer because we really don't get to the meat of the teachable lessons in order to bolster our confidence. We'll stop at the easy answers if we're not careful. Hmm. So when you say like, what am I here to learn? In other words, it's not just the, the, um, uh, the history exam. It's also learning how to learn for the history exam. It's also yes. learning the study habits and all of that. Yes. Yeah, right. that's true, yeah. That's so, this it's is so it. hard, especially as a parent, right? It's so hard because, you, you know, you can, you know that it has to happen. And yet there's still this thing of, but yeah, but, you know, I want him to do well. And I, and I, I don't want to see him in pain. 
Yes, yes. And but what happens, and we see this with gifted children all the time when they leave their gifted schools, they go away to university and, and it's a whole different world and everybody's capable and competent. They're the ones that struggle and have the most challenge matriculating through the university system. Yeah. And, and let's talk about the other aspect that you mentioned. What am I here to teach? Yeah. Because that's an important one, right? In what sense? How would, how would you explain it to someone to, to approach a subject? Yeah. So part of it, um, when you're thinking is, you know, okay, there's learning and you ask yourself the question several times to get to the meat of it. But as high performers, our job is to pass on this knowledge, whether it's to your kids, to your family members, or to the teams that you lead in order that we don't create this cyclical process. Mm -hmm. Well, you learn that for yourself. You learn that for yourself. Then our learning and our growth of our companies and our teams is slow. But part of us being willing to ask that question of who am I here to teach? means letting go of your ego and your pride and your hubris. Hey guys, I just screwed this up, right? I just screwed this up. Here's my mistake. Yeah. When you can get to that place of teaching and you open that vulnerability, it helps grow your confidence because by wow, yeah, you know what? It wasn't that bad. And it feeds that whole thing that we're trying to be, which is high performers who really genuinely can let go of that fear of failure because nobody's like, oh, I shared it and that was the worst that happened. Mm, right. Yeah, and, and creating that environment where people feel comfortable to let their guard down. Yes. As a leader, I think it's, it's one of the most important and most difficult things. Yeah. And, and, and we have to lead the way in that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how like just saw there's, there was a song we were listening to by this guy named Ren. And he said, you know, that life got easier when he learned to soften, when he learned to, you know, like, like, you know, same with dancing, right? You just have to, yeah, you, you can't be so tight. And it's the same with companies and everything, right? You yeah. have to let the ego dissolve. And, and to teach someone, it takes a certain degree of humility to teach, but it also, it kind of teaches you when you are explaining it to someone, you pick up a lot of the things that you may not have understood mm. about the subject. So there is, there is even your own benefit to doing it and yeah. growth together. Yeah. yeah. And the problem is though, is because we're kind of caught up in it, we want to rush through those failures so quickly. Right? We don't right. want to throw that up. Oh my God. Oh my God. And if we don't sit in it a little bit and really reflect on in it, like that's where the grit and the resilience and the learning, like that's where it really happens. Yeah. So don't move through it so quickly. It's hard when you're in it. Right. Trust me. I've been there. Friends, we hope you're finding value in the content. If you're enjoying what you're watching, please consider hitting the like button. Help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notification button to stay up to date with everything going on in the channel. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you, how do you help people through that when they're inevitably want to either skip through it or, or quit when they, when they yeah. get the stuff? Man. Well, I'll tell you a story about, you know, having coached Guyana to the world cup qualifiers, my uh, Caribbean country, the very, very best, but, uh, we didn't quite make it. And in the, like the final seconds of the game, uh, Trinidad and Tobago ties the score. And that night I get a phone call from the president on my WhatsApp bragging and saying how great an experience it was and how nice it was. And in the morning I was fired from the job, right? You know, like from the Federation and you know, you're the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. That's high performance sport. And I would be lying if I said to you, oh, it's easy. Like that stayed with me for months. In fact, it's years later and I still think about it, but here's the deal about how you get through it. Number one, for me, it's really about your community of people around you, right? It's one thing to say, oh, remember how great you are. Use your affirmations, write your self-confidence letter, do your affirmations. Those things work to a certain point, but you need your people around you, mm. right? You need your people around you to remind you of your greatness. And number two, which I think is really healthy, is that we need to make sure that we are well-rounded people, that all our success and our identity is not tied up in just one narrow scope of who we are and what we're about. Get, yeah. find success and meaning in other areas of our lives. Yeah, that's the, that, that seems like I, I've, you know, I, I had a, um, a, a childhood friend who went on to, uh, she was the, the captain of Stanford swim team and Pan Am game winner and stuff. And, and then when it was over, it's like, well, who am I? Yeah. Right. Like, I, you know, your, your whole identity is wrapped up in that. And, you know, obviously, I mean, you know, she found herself and all that, but, but it wasn't easy, you know, like you, you can, you can really let your identity be 
because you're especially when you especially in a sport like like swimming or probably most high level sports where you spend so much of your day. Yeah. Well, I can imagine even people in your field. How many years have you trained in that? And can you, I couldn't imagine if an injury or a neurological something came for somebody who couldn't use their hands, where their that loss of identity would just. Now what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it's a reason why a lot of, um, at least in in medicine, a lot of medical doctors don't seem to ever want to retire. And 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 part of that is because that's who you are, right? Like you know, or if you let that happen, right? You just you don't you can't imagine your life not doing it. Um, which is, I mean, it's not, it's not all bad, right? There is good in that, but there is some, there is, there is a danger in it too, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's a difficult. I think a balance, yes, a, a balance in anything and everything, uh, coming from the, the wisdom of the ages from samurai to through all the ages where they say that, you know, the warrior needs to be able to paint. And, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these is to widen the scope of your influence on the world and also to, to take away some of that identity with, you know. Yeah, with the yeah. warrior or with with whatever you identify, and we certainly do know do know people that identify as doctors, and oh yeah, that is the end of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so something I really wanted to ask you in in your book, you talk a lot about the importance of positive reinforcement and catching people when they're doing good things, and 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 uh, giving them reinforcement at those moments. Uh, how do you think about coaches like Bobby Knight uh, for with? <laughs> Yeah, for those who don't know, Bobby, <laughs> Bobby Knight was a, was a famous, I don't know if he's, is he still alive? I'm not no, sure. No, no, he's, he's not. He's not away. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he, was, he was a very famous uh, coach of Indiana University basketball, notoriously hot-headed, throwing things. I imagine extremely negative with the players. That certainly was how he was perceived. And very winning, right? You know, they, they, they loved him because he won, even if the players didn't love him. Um, I, don't, I don't, you know... How are, is there is there a place for that? Was he just sort of lucky? What's the way to think about all that? Well, it's true that he did win early in his career, right? And you know, it's important to note that Bobby Knight was a coach that was able to recruit players, right? That could either align with that or knew what they were getting and expecting, right? He had this yeah. reputation. But eventually, you'll notice that near the end of his career, the last 10, 15 years, Bobby Knight didn't win. Mm. The best talent didn't go to Bobby Knight anymore because that's not who they wanted to be coached by or how they wanted to be coached. And here's the deal. We know, whether we're leaders in the corporate world or on the coaching world or in educators, that if we fix mistakes, people will improve slowly, right, over time. Hey, you, you know, this isn't the way... You know, you shoot a ball, make sure your elbow's up high and your wrist falls through and your finger's the last thing on the ball. Or, hey, folks, you know, this isn't the way I want a briefing note. You've missed all the key points. Whatever it is, this isn't what we're doing. What happens, though, when we fix mistakes is we take away the confidence, the magic, that whatever that relationship connection is that we have with people, and then people become shyer. They become less um, they're more risk averse and less likely to take chances because they don't want to screw it up. Oh, I could fit that ball in the hole right there. But if I miss the coach is going to yell at me, I'm just going to pass here. Yeah. If we ignore people's mistakes and instead focus on people doing the same action, right. And reinforce the coaching points. Hey, Bob, great job with the elbow high. I love the way you snapped your wrist and followed through with your finger. Same coaching points. What we have found is improvement of the performance increases exponentially. Mm -hmm. We praise the process. And the theory behind this is Bandura's social learning theory, right? People can learn through observation. What we have found is it engenders trust, loyalty, and increases performance. Yeah. Colleen Hacker is a yeah. famous sports psychologist if you want to read a book on this called Catch Them When They're Good. And she used it with the U.S. women's national team back in the day of Mia Hamm and Julie Foudy and all those women winning like world championships like nobody's business yeah praise the process and watch people cling to you and run through the wall for you as a leader and do, do you would you take the same approach about self-talk is that also important when you're practicing by yourself to catch yourself doing something and just keep reinforcing that absolutely right absolutely here's the here's the science behind self-talk when you praise and and do self-talk and affirmations Three a day by Sonia Lubomowski from Harvard did this study. If you're in the marketing world, you increase your productivity by about 17 to 
if you're in the uh, diagnostic, analytic, problem-solving world, you're 23 to 27% faster to solve complex problems. And finally, if you're in the revenue generation world, sales, closing the deal, 27 to 33% increase in your sales revenue year over year. But and, you know, like what we tell ourselves we become, and that's really, really important to praise ourselves all the time as much as we can. How do you change negative self-talk to positive self? Because even as I'm saying that, I, I, I imagine myself later saying to myself in my head, like, see, you need to do self-talk positively. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right. So this is where the book title comes, this skill. So you've got to train yourself. So when you hear negative talk, how I'll work with my coaching clients is practice a physical cue, what we call a centering exercise. Watch professional athletes when they make a mistake or they point to somebody or they clap overhead, snap your fingers, disrupt the thought pattern yeah. and then replace it with your go-to affirmation. And your positive talk should counter what's in your head. I mean, you look so fat in those pants. Hey, stop it. Right. Right. You look great today. I can't do this. I'm so dumb. Hey, you can learn anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Make and eventually it becomes automatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. It's funny because we, we tend to. I, you know, especially if we've been doing negative self-talk for our whole lives. Years, yeah. It becomes part of your identity. And it's almost like if you lose that voice, you're losing a part of your identity. It's like, I can't, I can't stop that because that's me. Like, who, who would I be if I wasn't yelling at myself all the time? <laughs> yeah, no. And lots of folks do it. Really high on female athletes. Um, really high on people who have been promoted really quickly and don't feel like they're able and capable. Mm. Uh, folks that struggle with imposter syndrome, it's, yeah. it's in there all the way at the front of their voice. But you just keep after it and slowly, slowly yeah. it just changes. You'll see the frequency of it start to diminish. What I do sometimes is I have people chart, right? Just every time you feel like some, just put it in your iPhone, just a little, just a little sign, whatever it might be. And you'll watch over time that there's less and less of those check marks that are indicating their negativity. Mm. Mm. So it's sort of a physical cue. Yep. Kind of like to reset yourself or like yeah. baseball players do all, you know, before they yes. bat like a million different things, but just to, to reset yourself. And then, and then you know what affirmation you're going to plug in. Yes. And I remember in, in the book, you talked about how the affirmation has to be real. In other words, just, just telling yourself fanciful things that you, you know, aren't true. Yeah. Doesn't really help. Yes, it's true. Right. The, the affirmations have to speak to the negative talk and they have to be real with something that you're in control of. You know, mine were, Nobody outworks me, right? Okay, yeah. I can stay here. I can learn anything. Sometimes people, I'm going to be a millionaire, right? I mean, some people will say that's great to say, but you know, instead of being, I'm going to be a millionaire, what's the process that you, if you want to be a millionaire, what's the process, right? right? I, I'm, I, I read great books. I make good choices, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, something I, I wanted to ask you about the, the positive reinforcement part. Are there some people that, we, that you think might respond? Like, is, are, is there a subset of people that do better with negative reinforcement? That, that, you know what I mean? Like, that's just respond to a different coaching style? This, this is a common question, right? And so I will say this. I've never met somebody who did not need and want love and appreciation, right? Now, yeah. here's the deal. Does that mean that some people can't take criticism better than others? Yes. Some people will can get after it and you can give them more criticism and they'll respond as well. But here's the science. The same people that will respond and can, are more persistent and resilient against critical behavior, the Bobby Knight style, they shine as well under love mm. and compliments. Some people, what we have found, don't like love and compliments and praise in public as well. And again, this is us getting to know our athletes, getting to know our performers and knowing how to deliver what that kind of feedback. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, there, there's a, um, uh, in, I forget what you would call it, conditional research or whatever, when they, when they look at the kind of conditioning that, that leads to the most long-term um, responses from, from animals in like cages with, with, with operating, and they, they give them, they find just what you're saying, that positive reinforcement works better than negative reinforcement. But works but what works even better than consistent positive reinforcement is actually intermittent positive reinforcement, somewhat unpredictable positive reinforcement. Yeah. Do you find that as well? Is it is that an important piece? This is what we call gen in, in the world of sport, we call this genuine positive feedback. 
Sometimes we're just warm and fuzzy just for the sake of it. The guy shoots the ball over the book. Nice try. You know, like that's just <laughs> verbal diarrhea. Like, no, it wasn't a nice try. You missed the net. You don't have to criticize him, but you should ignore that, mm. right? Save your genuine, authentic, positive feedback for when it really matters. Yeah. I remember, you know, people think, oh, you must be really warm and fuzzy. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. And I'll never forget one of my players said, you know what? I, I, during my senior year, I only remember getting two positive comments from, from Coach Ivan, right? And it's like, well, you must have been a mean coach. Nope, I didn't yell at them, but I right. saved those feedbacks for when it really mattered and when it yeah. really, really made the difference. Yeah. And that's the difference between me and another coach. And people are like, well, that, that's not nice. Well, I'm, I'm not coaching little kids, yeah. right? I'm coaching university students that are going to be professional athletes. And I want that positive feedback to be meaningful so that they know that there's trust and authenticity in our relationship. And, and not only that, but that player that got those two positive comments still remembers that. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and it meant more. You know, probably those two nice comments meant more to him than a million, you know, pats on the back. Yeah. yeah that's really, that's, that's yeah. interesting. Um, how do you, so go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think we're, we're about to talk about the same thing. But one of the things that as we're reading your book and listening to your talks, the, the same thing came, kept coming up, and, and you had mentioned it already. How do, we, how do we differentiate confidence and hubris? And how do we stay away from leaning too far into it and just kind of falling off that edge? Yeah. And I think this is a big piece, right? Like, how do we distinguish the difference um, between the bravado and the, you know, the braggadocious and the ego? Um, cause I'm talking about writing yourself a confidence letter, talking about how great you are, you know, complimenting yourself They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. First off, you have to remember the persona that typically needs these things. The persona that typically needs these things is not the person that's walking around at the track and field meet after winning all their medals and puts them on here and says, look at me, look at me. They're not the person in the sparkly dress that says, look at me, look at me. This person is usually quite the opposite. Right. The person that's usually always in the sidelines or always fairly quiet. Not necessarily, though. There are lots of extroverts out there that equally struggle with their confidence. And so you've heard me talk about the number one thing is what you tell others is ego and hubris. What you tell yourselves, that's your confidence. Right. Yeah. That's your brag sheet to yourself. When you write a brag sheet to build your confidence, when you have your self affirmation, again, you're reading those to yourself. This is the difference between the kid who walks around at the track and field meet and says, look at me, versus the kid who goes home at night, puts those ribbons on it in their quiet of their bedroom, looks in the mirror and says, I am the greatest, mm. right? That's the difference. Yeah. And make no apologies for being loud and proud to yourself. Is, is there an element that the, 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 the track star that walks around with the medals on their chest, are they... Is, is there any reason to think that they're just, that they're compensating and that they don't, that they're actually missing some of that internal confidence um, or not necessarily? Yeah, you know, I don't know if I could jump there, um, but I will say that, you know, I have often found that the people, like, let's go back to nature. The birds with the brightest feathers are the one that needs the attention because they're not getting it elsewhere. Hmm. The people who are quietly going about their business, um, are secure in their relationships and their connections, their meaning and their purpose. I have found that to be true. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, the kid walking around with the medals is no good or is full of horse manure or whatever the word you want to use, but there is something to be said about the person who does not need the external validation of strangers, of people that, that they don't know or who have no value to them. Right. What does that say? Is, do, you, do you ever, if you have someone who's kind of, Overly confident. If mm -hmm. someone someone's walking around very braggadocious, yeah. Do you ever find the need to knock them down a peg to to say, look, you know, this isn't this isn't helping this isn't helping you. It's not not say it, 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 it's not doing you any favors with your teammates. Um, you know, how do you how do you handle that without without ruining their confidence? Because obviously, confidence is key. Yeah, you know, there's a saying that we have in soccer. There's like there's those who talk. There's those who walk the talk, and then there's those who just walk, right? 
And so some of them talk, rah, rah, look how great I am. And he's like, I'm gonna just stay quiet and just, you know, you know. When I just say that, you know, I just think about this is that when people's behaviors are no longer good for them or to them, or no longer good for us or to us as a team, that's when I get involved, yeah. right? And what I mean by that is I can see the negative outcomes of the gossip or that people aren't passing them the ball or there's conversations happening. Sometimes people have grown up in different environments than us, right? A kid that grows, if I recruit a kid from, let's call it Brownsville, Texas, right? A Brownsville, Texas kid is much different in their persona and the way they must carry themselves than the kid from Iowa rural Midwest, right? If the kid from Brownsville, Texas, and I'm stereotyping here over the broad strokes, they better be brash and loud because they've got to own their space in their community. Hmm. And so there are some societal differences that I have to take into account before I address these things as um, a pejorative in the culture or the community that we're a part of. Hmm. And that means educating both sides in that conversation. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. It's funny because as you were saying that, I was wondering which was going to be the more braggadocious. I, I didn't know. I, I was thinking like, <laughs> I can see it both ways, actually. Like, you know, I, I think of Texas as sort of, oh, they're braggadocious. But, you know, like they, but you think of these like tough football people and they're yeah. often kind of calm off the field, actually. Yeah. They're hard, you know, Midwestern farmers, man. Solid, hardworking folks. Very quiet. Yeah. In my, yeah. In my, in my interactions with them. Yeah, 100%. And you know the thing you're talking about also with the the person who puts the ribbons away. I mean, it's also why we we were so enamored, I think, as a culture with like like war heroes that take their medals and they put them quietly in their mm -hmm. drawer, and you only find out you know the, the family only finds out about them you know when they when they pass away. And like we didn't even know. Yeah. Right? But it was on the inside. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a that's a cool trick to be able to do. Could you talk about that that the the letter? Um, that, that, the, the positive letter of affirmation. Yeah. You know, when we get into new situations, uh, promotions, new opportunities, it's not unlikely for folks to have a crisis of confidence. Um, this like, oh my God, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. Um, imposter syndrome. When I came from Iowa to become a director of athletics, I was a soccer coach. And all of a sudden I'm in charge of like millions of dollars and 50 people on a team. I didn't have the manager job, the associate director. I didn't know what to do, right? And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And so part of that is uh, living in that space is bringing out and writing a letter to yourself. And I call it the, your self-confidence letter, a personal brag sheet. A thing that just reminds you of your greatness. And you read that whenever the negative talk comes in or whenever before you're going into a meeting and you were like, oh my God, oh my God, calm down. It was my anxiety and coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I've worked with national champions and world champions, and this same process has helped them as high performers on the court or on the pitch. My brag sheet goes something like this. Dear Ivan, congratulations on choosing the right woman to marry. You set a goal of getting your PhD before the age of 40. Boom, you hit it out of the park. And so this is a letter to remind myself, hey, you've done great things. You can do this. And it helps settle the nerves and just yeah. build that dopamine again. Right. Is, is there something I was thinking of as I, as I was reading about that was I was thinking that there, there would be value, it seemed to me, but what do you think about writing that letter when you're down? So, you know, like sort of, sort of almost the, the reciprocal of that, which is I'm, I'm, in, I'm in terrible straits right now. These are all the problems. And then later you can open that letter up and say, God, you know, I've been down before. You know, yeah. I, I didn't see the way out before, but here I am. Here's the truth of the matter. It's really, really hard to write that letter when you're down. Mm. You can't see and appreciate all your gifts and talents. Yeah. And so sometimes people are like, oh my God, I can't. I'm trying to write this letter. I got not. I've had literally had people like, I got nothing. I'm not good at anything. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And when people are, don't have it, what I do then is I say to their, you need to reach out to your friends, three, four friends, and ask them for two things you're great at and then incorporate those things into a letter. I, I like that a lot. I, I was actually saying something a little different, which is when you're down in the dumps, to write the letter as, I am down in the dumps. I cannot see my way out of this. I think the world is falling down and I am never gonna be able to get through this. <laughs> and yeah. you write that, and so it doesn't help you maybe in that moment. In that moment, it's just a wallow letter, right? 
But a year later or a month later or six months later, when you look back at that, you're like, I can't believe I felt that way. You know, you know what? That's, that is actually a good one. I'm, I'm a little worried because they're like, yeah, you're right. I'm done. <laughs> This is what Dr. Joseph told me. <laughs> <laughs> but I do see what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Because right. you all have those moments. Yes. And, and sometimes it's hard to remember just how in despair we were. Oh, yeah. But sort of connecting to that, allow, you know, when you're feeling better, allows you to realize, wait a second, you know, this, these, are, these are the vic vicissitudes of life, right? We're going to... Yeah. I've been down, I got better, I'm down now, I'll get better again, that kind of thing. This is, this is somewhat similar to uh, advice for kids when they feel like this is it, right. this is yeah. the end of the world, write down the problem, and then have them two weeks later write, look at it and then write down how they feel about it then, and then two months later, and then do that over and over and they get into the pattern of knowing like, oh, right, I, I do tend to think that I'm, uh, the, the life is over, but yeah. I know in two weeks I'll feel differently and then in two months I may not even right. remember it. Right. Right, right. It's a way to capture that moment. So, that, yeah. Um, so, kind of speaking almost to that, you, you talk about setting high expectations for yourself and that being a skill in itself. Mm -hmm. So, how do you recommend people set high expectations when someone may be thinking of, how do I not overshoot it? How do I not yeah. set expectations that are way too high and unreachable? Yeah. And I think this is an important piece is that I want people to set expectations that may not be reachable. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any failure in that um, because the goal is not to reach the expectations and celebrate. It's I want you to think about whatever the goal is. There's a whole bunch of steps that lead towards that. It's like you're going up a pyramid and here's the step one and here's step two and here's step three and here's step four because we need to celebrate the processes along the way. We don't do that. We save all our magic for when we achieve the goal. Yay. Right. We have to recognize that some goals, some things that we're going to have are going to be five year, 10 year, 15 year, 20 year goals, lifetime goals. And there's nothing wrong with that. And so I just want to make sure that your listeners that are sitting there is like, oh, wow, if I don't make this outcome, how do I make it good enough so that I reach it? Because I want to feel good about myself. That's not what confidence is about. Confidence isn't about this check mark that you can check off these nice, easy, low hanging fruit and build your confidence. True and real confidence comes from when you accomplish hard things, things that made you stretch and grow and you didn't think you were going to do it. It's like, wow, I did that. That changes the momentum. Mm -hmm. But we forget to celebrate the dashboard gauges along the way. Yeah. And it's, such a, it's, it's so true too, because so many times when you reach the, the top of the mountain, you know, there's that moment, there's, there's a dopamine rush, and then there's almost a letdown, right? Because it's like, oh, okay, now, now, now what, right? But yeah. that goes back to, your, to, to celebrating the process, because usually the most rewarding part of getting to the top of the mountain is not necessarily arriving there, but the whole journey to it. Yeah, and it sounds so cliche, but you're so, I remember winning a national championship, and then like sitting down, I'm like, this is it. Like I built it up something so big in my head. It was disappointing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's kind of like, That's you know, crazy, isn't it? like the first time, you know, you like make whoopee or something or romance, you know, I'm yeah. like, oh, this is a children's show. Keep it, keep it. <laughs> it just, it didn't have like, like if you chase something and you build it up and build it up, then there's this emptiness that comes with it. And you haven't really enjoyed the process of it either. Yeah. But even, even with really that. You any of that out, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point about, re about setting those very high expectations, then that leaves you the next step, right? You win that national championship, but that's not the whole journey, right? That yes. is a huge step, huge mile, a milestone, but then you have the next step. So you don't necessarily feel that let down. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's why when you see champions be champions, the next thing that they're doing is training for the next season. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. When my players won that championship, the very next day, even though I gave them two, two weeks off, they were in the gym training. That's a high performer mindset. Right. Yeah, something, I, this is a little bit off, off, the, off the topic, but I was dying to ask you. So after you took this small soccer club and you made them national, you, brought, you, 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 you led them to a national championship, did you consider going professional after that? I mean, that's amazing. It's, it's kind of unbelievable. It's, you know, a, it's a Disney movie. You're a you Disney know, movie. 
I just realized that you're, you're actually a Disney movie. Let's we'll take it. You know, I never considered myself a soccer coach. I don't watch soccer on TV. I don't go to games. I've always considered myself an educator first. And because of that, soccer is not enough to hold me. I love the teaching part of the game and the relationship part of the game. So never, you know, I just retired and you know, what am I doing now? I'm an assistant soccer coach again. Right. Is that right? Is that, is that? That's my retirement gig. I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Well, I was, just, yeah, yeah, I was just thinking if, if, if Man City needs a new coach, <laughs> I, I would, I would be willing to go there and just wear an earpiece and you just tell me everything to say <laughs> and we'll just, we'll just play it that way. <laughs> But in, in terms of coaching, how do you help your players or outside of, you know, sports, how do you help people build and then retain new skills? That seems like a critical yeah. piece. So a couple of things I want to remind people of, like there is science, like there's more learning, there's science behind skill acquisition. And we have to recognize for your readers, this is the, I'll simplify this. There's a difference between skill acquisition and skill retention, how quickly you get a skill and how long you retain and learn a skill are two different things that we must make sure we train differently. If we want to get a skill quickly, we just do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Right. And oh man, at the end of the session, we'll look like we've mastered it, but you come back a month later and we're not good at it. But if we do a skill and we want to make sure we've learned it, do that skill, then try a different skill and try a different skill and try a different skill. And even though at the end of the session, none of them will be strong, a month later, your learning will be higher and increased. Mm -hmm. So it's not just repetition, repetition, repetition paired with persistence, but there's got to be variances of that skill. Yeah. Don't just sit there and do the same thing 10,000 times because you, you learned that from Gladwell. That's not the science of it. Right. How, how when you say variance, how varied, uh, how, how much variance do you want? So let's say if you... If you take a specific skill, do you want the, uh, a different skill that you're working on completely different or in somewhat relation, some, somewhat related to, to it? So, so here's the science of coaching. Let's say you have three skills, A, B, and C. If you do skill A, 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 mm, learning will be okay at the bottom. If you do skills A, A, B, B, C, C, A, A, B, B, C, C, skill is better than just doing A all the time. But if you do ACBA, ACC, CBAA, that's where it is. Truly random, three unique and novel skills. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is you have to groove the different uh, motor neurons or different yeah. pathways, right? Now, this is in physical skill. I don't know the same could be said about cognitive skill, mm -hmm. but there is an element of cognitive I would, skill. I would bet, I mean, I don't know either actually, but, but it, it makes sense, intuitive sense that that would be the case. Because you're, you're also making those neuronal pathways more plastic. Yes. Right, where they, they have to be able to adapt and because when you're going to call on them, you're going to call on them, on, you know, in a time that you can't predict, maybe. And yes. so it needs to be accessible. At and, that time. and there's an element of novelty, too, which yes. yeah. calls your attention to full focus. Yes. Yeah. 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 And people like our coaches don't learn it. There's a science behind teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But we just go and do the drills and do over and over and over again, the lines and, and this. But. That's been, that's been a huge difference in my ability to teach and coach. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, you know, something I wanted to ask you was, would you, as a coach, let's say on a soccer team, would you rather a really gifted physical specimen of a, of an athlete with a bad attitude, or would you rather sort of a mediocre physical specimen with a great attitude? It, hands down, it's never ever about like it's never ever about talent or physical skill. It's oh. always about the people, the culture, and relationships. In this assistant coaching team I took, I just cut the very, very, very best player. He was too ego. It was all about him. I wished him well. He's landed on another place. But no, you if if a person is not willing to put the team and his and his teammates first, you will never have a successful team. Let me share with you a story from the NBA. Everybody thinks that task or talent are the things that build it. Task cohesion, how we do our job, X, Y, Z. In the 80s, they went to predict who would be the winning of, um, basketball team. And everybody thought it would be talent or height or salary cap. It was fist bumps, high fives, chest bumps, butt taps. What we in sports psychology call social cohesion. 
mm. how well we're connected together, how well we stay together, how much we feel like we matter and we belong. Huh. Social cohesion leads to high performance. If anybody on my team distracts from social cohesion, I don't want them to be a part of it. Yeah. How, how do you, are, are there ways better than others to um, instill social cohesion in a group? For sure. We have to be intentional in team building activities, right? Now, don't mistake this. Social cohesion means we get everybody on the same, from the same cultural values, the same norms, the same pieces. No, social cohesion is, yes, diverse teams because we know they perform better. Social cohesion means we're that aligned in our values. We're clear on what our purpose is. So we attract like-minded people. Mm -hmm. We call this recruiting on the front end. We don't do this enough. And so we get people who want different values. What's our North star? Yeah. If I'm saying that we are here to win a national championship as a coach, or we are here to be elite in everything that we do, or we are here to serve the underserved, whatever it might be that are, then the people who are coming there will be aligned with that. And if they're not, what happens is soon as something hard comes or tough, they look to jump ship. Yeah. Here's what it is. And we haven't taken care of alignment of purpose. When there's alignment of purpose, what happens on a high performing team? Innovation goes up, grievances go down, profits go up, sick days go down, retention and well-being go up, all the negative things go away. Last and certainly not least, and I'm, I'm speaking fast here because I know we're running out of time, but I want to get this in. For me, we then have to be intentional in creating and, and, and fostering opportunities to have genuine and authentic relationships. And so that's a lot and team. lots of team building. Yes, it, it, yeah. in the team, across the team, up and down and throughout the team. Yeah. There's no freshman hazing, right? There's accessibility to the leadership. So for your corporate clients, it means that the boss gets out of their office and walks around and engages in conversations that does has, has nothing to do with work. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's something I wanted to, and I know we're almost out of time. So I, 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 I really wanted to ask you this, um, sort of along those lines, I, I recently was talking to someone who was on a team, uh, and the coach was a real, uh, jerk, you know, and, and really pushed the, the, the players to, to the brink and they all were, they, they, they all didn't like the coach. And I said, well, that is a form of cohesion that he's building. You know, like he's, he's, you, you have all coalesced around a, around a, you know, a target. And that maybe, I don't know if it's intentional or not, but there is something that's happening there. You know what? I knew a coach that was his style, right? This, if you are united and, and, and together in hating me, then you've got one thing to fight for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <right>. I don't <laughs> know if it's my to... style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can see how it would be better to, to, um, uh, to rally around a North Star of winning the national championship. Better than hatred. For Better the than hatred. For <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. <laughs> this is, I, yeah, I think, I, I mean, we can take it into, but this is, this has been great. This is, there's so much to think about. Um, and I feel like I have a lot of things to work on in the office. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Ivan, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for all the, all, all the, the great content you put out there. And yes. your book is fantastic. We, we, you know, we really uh, enjoyed it. Yeah, we it's really enjoyed it. I, 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 I generally am not a fan of self-help books. And I, I think I mentioned to you last time we talked that, um, you know, I, I kind of went into the book thinking like, okay, another self-help book. And then as I'm reading, I'm like, this is really good. Like, it's really useful. Thank There's you. not a lot of platitudes. It's, I, I really have a, ha had a lot of takeaways. So it was really, I, and it's almost I like a workbook. book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, that's what I tried. I tried a meaningful workbook without any, like it didn't need to be this big. When I was done, I had nothing more to say. So it's not a big, thick read. It's, I'm hoping it's helpful. And thank you for the kind compliments. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Friends, thank you for your attention. We hope you've enjoyed the conversation. If you find value, please remember to hit the like button, help us with our YouTube algorithm. Consider subscribing to the channel and turn on the notifications so you can stay up to date with everything going on with the channel. And please leave us a comment, let us know what you thought about the show and also what you'd like to hear about in the future.